and the substantive review materials. Okay, let's, let's just go over it. I'll try not to take all the time and and then the, we'll open it up for, for question. Okay. If 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 any of you have specific questions on these materials, <clears throat> you, you can feel free to raise your hand and and I'll I'll seek to respond interactively. <coughs> okay. Um so final review. I'm I'm gonna mention some topics. Now look, obviously. I can't put all the material from the class in these slides. I mean, that would be pointless, right? Um, um, and uh, so what I'm doing is highlighting areas that I think, like the fact that an area is listed here means I think it's important enough that I, there's a good chance I will test on. Um, and so the very inclusion of what I'm presenting to here, what's listed here, is indicative of what I think is important. This is not merely a summary of, a descriptive summary of what we've done, but the things I think are really important enough that I would test on them, okay? Um, I would hold you responsible for knowing some things about, about these. Um, so inspections and peer reviews, different types of peer reviews, how they differ from one another, et cetera. Continuous integration, some some understanding of of um, you know what uh, what goes on there. Uh, what's the smoke test, for example? What what role does it play? Uh, what other things besides compilation might be part of a continuous integration build, for example? Code contracts or specifications. I mean, these are really should be in the same line. I don't know why they're separate. Um, so the idea of providing a, a specification for code, be it a class or be it a function, um, uh, and and a whole lot on testing, right? Testability, general principles of testing, the V model of testing, where you have like low level implementation verified by unit tests, you know, sort of, you know, higher level or sort of lower level design by integration tests, higher level design or architecture by system tests, et cetera. Um, you have automated tests, you have requirements by automated tests. Um, Path-based testing, prime paths, notion of subsumption, um, notion of transition coverage, covering node coverage, for example. Um, if, you, if you do transition coverage, you automatically achieve node coverage. Testability. Um, I had noted uh, you know, ways to make a system more more testable, right? Um, uh, we discussed many of these. Some involve specifications. Some involve, you know, separation of concerns. Um, having that end to your architecture, dividing things up into to smaller pieces, um, each with a well defined interface, a function or a method with a well defined interface. Um, Testability also includes things like use of assertions, use of logging, for example, um, even things like scripting languages that we didn't talk much about. Test hooks are another thing that can help testability, for example. Um, uh, good variable naming uh, helps, helps testability as well. <clears throat> and we discussed some other components. The concept of mocking is very important um, uh, as well. Um, for isolating components, for allowing you to test against them before they're even written. <clears throat> and a bit of testing for, for object-oriented systems. So you wanna test that well, the subclass adheres to list of substitution principles. Test case design and testing procedures um, uh, are, all, are, are all things that might be important. The notion that look when you perform a set of tasks <clears throat> just like is automatically done with containerization or maybe manually or maybe done you know as a explicit thing when you're in other test environments you know if, if the test makes modifications they have to be rolled back so you don't <clears throat> so that the test is completely reproducible with respect to a set set of conditions if, if you run the test now 
and it modifies things, and then you run it next against the modified things, you're not really running it again. You know, the, the, it's not comparable. It's not reproducible. Um, so you restore the environment. It should log information about whether it's been successful or not, right? The test. Um, log messages, again, about, you know, uh, anything that went wrong, um, uh, et cetera. Um, Safe subtyping, we talked about Liskov substitution. Oh my gosh, I don't know what's, what's going on here. Um, we talked about safe subclassing, which is a separate issue. The subclassing has to do with um, implementation. Remember this add all versus add. Um, and you know, you're not sure, do I override? If I override add, is that get me for free? you know, updating the implementation of, of what add all does, or do I have to override that as well? It depends, does it call add? Remember that? That was that whole issue of safe subclassing, which has to do with implementation, where safe subtyping has to do with contracts and promises made. You want to you know, have some understanding of that. Uh, quality coding, you know, we talked about code smells and, and bad variable naming, large, large functions, functions which Taken many, many, many different variables, you know, um, very um, tight coupling between different areas of a system, um, for example. Uh, and, um, and, you know, there's many, many aspects of that uh, beyond bloated methods and, um, and uh, classes without clear responsibilities, um, solid principles applied here. Um, um, requirement solicitation, we talked about, um, continuous integration, well, that's already there, risk management, um, multi-tier architectures we got to this, this year, um, the notion of dividing, having these separation into different layers is helping for many things, helping scalability, helping division of work in the team, helping separation of, of concerns as far as use of different languages, as far as having sort of different aspects of the system in those different layers, the ability to mock out one component for the other. So you could have the same business logic, use it from a web, a web application on the one hand and use it from a smartphone on the other. It's using the same business logic layer. Um, and it's distinct from the front end for the user interface. We talked about how it helps with, with scalability and, and handling many, many clients. Uh, and uh, it also helps with the evolvability because the, the user interface often involves faster than the business logic. Um, and having different database layers can allow for testing the business logic without coupling it to frobbing this database. It could let you test it with input from other, other things, from files or whatever. You decouple the business logic from the particular persistence mechanism used for it. Um, uh, risk management has been a key thing um, that we've emphasized many times. Uh, contingency planning, uh, mitigation, risk exposure, this idea of considering um, probability times severity of something happening on the risk score. The, the, the implication if it does happen, as well as the probability that it will happen, you know, considering both of those. Um, uh, and effective risk management involving risk scanning on an ongoing basis, looking for risks that were previously identified that materialize or new risks that are coming about and documenting them, proactively handling those risks and discussing them. Uh, Multi-tier architectures, so we mentioned, and, and then we, we talked a little bit about uh, things like uh, planning poker for estimation and defect estimation techniques. So look, overall themes for this course, you know, proactive thinking, proactive handling of situation, flying ahead of the plane, action to lower vulnerabilities. It, it's not a matter that you're immune to lightning strikes. It's just that um, you make yourself uh, less vulnerable and you don't attract the lightning by putting up a, a giant flagpole or something. Um, uh, you, you lower your vulnerabilities. Um, you lower your, your chance that, um, if things go wrong, you'll be knocked off balance. Uh, we talked a lot about risk management, uncertainty, risk, and, and, 
and flexibility. Um, handling risk proactively with things like spike prototypes, right? Um, to, to identify risks early. Um, handling in your iterations risks, prioritizing things of high risk early. So if something goes wrong, you know, you won't use that framework, you use a, di a different framework. Um, uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's important for managing these risks as team two learned with a, uh, with a ill-fated uh, uh, ill -fated interface uh, uh, tool at, at, at one point early on. Um, uh, weaknesses occur at interface. Um, this is not a point I really emphasize, but it's true. Things fall through the cracks uh, between people. Things fall through the cracks when there are sort of separations between different areas of a system. You know, the, what a one means here could be different from what a one means over there in terms of an error code. So you gotta be careful. It's these interfaces between things, um, preconditions might not be met, et cetera. Um, talked about opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the, um, the value of things foregone. You, you decide to put your effort into this feature. It means you can't do that feature. Um, uh, you know, choosing things often means foregoing other choices. We don't have time to fix this this bug, for example, um, and uh, at the same time to finish this other feature. Which which do we want to do? You have to choose between things sometimes. Yeah. Um, handling things early again, uh, proactively. Um, talked about the pervasive impact of quality. Look. This is I in triangle, remember that? Um, um, we talked about it early on in the class. Um, uh, dollars and budget on the one vertex, another vertex, uh, uh, the, the value delivered or, 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 or quality of the system, the scope often it's, you know, the scope of it. Um, and, and then the other one, the schedule. Getting one is easy, getting two, can be done if you're willing to sacrifice the third. Getting all three is hard. Um, and quality has these pervasive impacts, pernicious impacts, ramifications all across the system. It ripples through to debugging time. It ripples through to undiagnosed defects um, that are in the system. It ripples through to the satisfaction of the, the client. It ripples through to schedule slips. It ripples through to issues of of uh, ability to, to fix things in code that's too crufty, et cetera. There's, there's just these, all these impacts on quality. It impacts morale. Uh, it impacts turnover in real projects and ability to hire effectively, et cetera. Impacts the need to document, et cetera. Um, so uh, quality is one of these things that cuts across the entire, entire project. And the truth is, Investing in quality um, early and often is one of these things that can achieve all three goals of the iron triangle. It'll let you deliver more value and, 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 and achieve that sort of scope, manage the risks so you can achieve the scope that you are trying to um, within budget and within time. Um, and you know, much of this class has been discussing the sort of soft and the hard, right? It's, it's the human side, the human theater of software engineering, software development, as well as things like the Liskov substitution principle, issues having to do with safe subclassing, uh, issues having to do with uh, path-based testing, et cetera. So we talked early on about key best practices and you know, generally I expect you'd be very familiar with them. You've lived most of these, so I'm not, not really worried accountable positions, uh, peer reviews uh, and types of peer reviews, um, uh, uh, incremental delivery, this idea of smoke testing, um, the notion of designing for testability, right? In including possibly test hooks. Um, so building in plans for testability, the idea of spike prototypes, these throwaway prototypes, difference, you know, prototype and other, in just an early stage project as a prototype is something you toss away, but you learn from, right? Um, you, you learn about the risks or you learn how to do something. Um, 
Uh, Test-driven development is something that I've emphasized, although I think not everyone adhered to. Um, <clears throat> uh, this idea of, uh, of having planning poker to come up with a, a joint estimate um, is valuable. And um, you know, one of the key things is, look, if you find uh, this class really emphasizes when you <coughs> when you discover something that went wrong, when you discover a bug, look, even if you never fix the bug, you can fix the process that led to the bug. You can ask, what is it that allowed that to come about? Was it a you know, misunderstanding within the team about how um, this side of the project works? Was it a miscommunication? Was it a lack of documentation? Was it a, um, um, would it have been helped by better specifications, et cetera? Um, uh, but you can also ask why, how is it that it went undetected for, for this long? You can ask these questions when things go wrong, how can we do better next time? Not only about, you know, the technical fix, but about fixing your process, right? Identifying what in the process left you vulnerable to this. That's an important lesson. Um, so, uh, this whole idea of process improvement is 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 quite important. Um, you've lived pull requests. Um, you've lived some peer reviews for pull requests, or at least you know reviews on them better than looks good to me. And um, you've sought to really put together test cases at different levels that are effective. So I think. You have most of these things um, in hand. Um, uh, bear in mind what risk scanning is, right? It's always scanning for risks that, um, again, were identified earlier that are coming about or new risks that, that are, are being, uh, that are coming about that you hadn't previously um, identified. We talked about early on about requirements. You know, there's this whole idea of how to elicit requirements reliably. And I gave you some tips there on um, beyond saying how the absolutely central importance of requirements. If you, fix, if you fix an issue that's off about requirements early um, and you compare the cost for that on the one hand, and you contrapose it with the cost for fixing it later, um, in later phases of the project, the cost rises exponentially or geometrically. It goes up, you know, um, super linearly, faster than than just linearly. Um, it's 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 pretty exponential if you look at the data on it, because things get built on top of it, right? If a requirement is off, design gets built around it, and plans for you know, and code gets built around it and tests for that code get built around it, parts of user interface. And more and more then has to be ripped out and replaced, right, with the rework. Um, so requirements, getting things right at the requirements level um, often will, will really, really help you um, speed up your ability to deliver on time within budget on scope. Um, now, I spoke about these techniques for trying to lower miscommunication, the ambiguities that come up, the, the fact that one person is using a term in a very technical way, the other interprets it as a very colloquial term, um, or think they know what it means and they don't. Um, I talked about the role of repetition, you know. Um, um, uh, so, so asking them to repeat what they said in different words or rephrasing it yourself and repeating it back to the stakeholder, for example, or circulating in written form requirements to the stakeholder and ask him, it, did it capture it well, which is a way of kind of rephrasing it and providing it back to them. All those can really lower the chance that requirements are misunderstood. Um, bear in mind that it gets more messy when you have multiple stakeholders because they can have different visions and they can disagree and you might not discover that until late. Um, yeah, 
I think that's um, that's good. I, I did comment, I think, at one point in this course, very important lesson. Um, when it comes to ensuring that a project is successful, um, <coughs> it helps for you to find what success is on your own terms. If you're proactively thinking about what is successful, and that may sound strange, but what I mean by this is setting expectations is often a huge component of what it means to be a successful project. Same stakeholder may be very, very pleased by your result or very disappointed by the result of the same delivery, the same technical project, depending on what their expectations were. Right. If you set the expectations sky high and you deliver something that's pretty good, they may be disappointed. If you set the expectations very moderately and you deliver something that's pretty good, they may be very happy. So expectation setting is a large part of what it means to, to secure a successful project. There are parts of us that want to promise the moon, but we often do well to proactively set expectations moderately and over deliver, right? Um, we often benefit from that. Um, risk management, you know, we talked about contingency planning and mitigation. Contingency planning has strategies which are only enacted when something, when a risk materializes, right? When it, something goes wrong, then we enact them. Contin mitigation is investing upfront to either lower the risk that it occurs or minimize the damage if it does occur. Um, uh, you, could, you have mitigation on, on either side to that. You can try to prevent it from going wrong, the risk coming about, or just make it minimal impact um, or lower impact. You can also sometimes accept the risk. Um, we accepted the risk that we're going to use GitHub this term. Um, GitHub build and you know we see what happened. And another way is to avoid you know to avoid it altogether. I mean you can sometimes sidestep something, say, look, this is too big a risk with um this uh framework. We're going to, you know, instead of using um Docker because of the root level access issue, um we will instead use uh Rocket or 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 some other um, singularity or for scalable um, uh, scalable um, Docker compatible images that don't require uh, root level access. Um, it's an ongoing process. Should be explicit, conscious, and active. It should be you know reach across the team and learning what what's going wrong. Um, again, flying ahead of the point deliberately working to identify vulnerabilities and lowering them. Um, you know, often involves brainstorming a bit about what could go wrong in a document. I'm not going to test the details, the catastrophe brainstorm, but it does involve prioritization often. And here you often have, on the one hand, probability it will occur, and on the other hand, severity if it occurs. And sometimes we multiply them, and it's called risk exposure. I didn't really emphasize this 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 term, but the ability the idea is that you know overall priority is often a combination of how bad it will be if it happens and the likelihood of happening. Um, I don't I'm not sure if I emphasize this term, the notion of a bus you know the bus number, but the the idea with the bus numbers you know you you um, want to have a project that. Um, if one per you're in bad shape, if if something happens to even one person in your project, it can't continue, right? You want a high bus number. You want you want to if multiple people are sick, you still want to be able to proceed effectively. And projects will sometimes talk about their bus number. You know, if it's one, you're in bad shape because it means one person getting hit by a bus, um, you'll be doomed to your project. Um, and you know, defect discovery, spike prototypes, directed triage, defect discovery, like via bug parties, estimating the number of defects. These are all aspects 
in a way of risk management, um, in a way, you know, testing, um, testing is as well. Um, it's learning about what's out there. Um, contracts and specifications. Um, we talked about how these specify sort of what can be counted on. Um, and we, we really uh, emphasized preconditions and postconditions for, for methods. Um, you can have invariance if the method is kind of stateful, but um, sometimes you have it divided up in different ways, right? You have preconditions, postconditions, a return. Um, what's returned? I folded them into postconditions here. Um, and then for a class as a whole, you have invariance, things like it's always greater than zero, something you could check at any one time. <clears throat> And history properties, where you compare its value at one time, T1, value at another time, T2. And there may be some structure there. So its value at time T2 is always greater than or equal to its value at time one. Think the counter example, right? Or think the course timer. It, it can only stay the same or go up, um, can't go down. Um, is a classic history property. Another key one is it never changes, right? It's invariant. Its value at time of T1 and T2 is the same. Um, it's, it's constant. Um, that, that wouldn't be an invariant in the sense that at any one time, its value is greater than zero or something, it's, but it, it doesn't vary, it's constant. You know, it's a, it's a value object, uh, it's immutable. Um, and, you know, I talked about how modularity and specifications help. The notion of what I can count on with a class or with a method or a function. Um, <clears throat> the notion of what's guaranteed there um, is really, really helpful for the creators of that abstraction. Say it's a method, it's a method or the function or the class. Because they have a understanding of, if they know they've promised these things, they know they can't change them. And so by implication, if they haven't changed it, if they haven't promised this, if it's not implied by what they promised, they can change it, right? They, and they know they can change it, no one should be counting on it. Meanwhile, for the users of the abstraction, they know what these promises, these guarantees provided, um, they know what they can count on. Um, and um, so that they know this value is always greater than zero, will always be greater than zero, or they know that never declines, or they know this never contains a, a null key, or never contains a null value when you look up with a given key, or there's no duplicates in it, or this array is always in a sorted order or what have you. If they have a guarantee of that in a specification, <clears throat> they know their code can count on it. And it won't be that their code is broken when the API is next, you know, the next version comes out or something. They know that's a promise for this and I can count on it um, sticking because it's part of the specification, it's part of the contract here. Um, there's a lot of other benefits here, you know, conceptual clarity um, about what's guaranteed. You don't have to, you know, test it. You know, you, you try testing it out with these values and you say it seems to work. That's, that's you know, a pale cipher of hope. That's, that's pretty, pretty marginal hope because it could always change. Um, maybe it will change. If you're just basing it on testing it, oh, it seems to work. Well, Pretty fragile stuff. It's like walking on thin ice. Um, uh, and at the same time, specifications let you document certain areas of the system before they're even implemented. And you can do review of the design. Um, you can directly derive many assertion checks. It's like a no brainer. Preconditions go into assertions, post conditions go into assertions. 
um, invariance history properties. They're just gimmies for assertions, right? Um, you can create test cases very easily for it um, and easier integration. You can also mock it out. I don't know why mocking is not, oh man. You know, declarative mocking frameworks, um, uh, easier mocking, right? Um, um, you, you can say this thing, you know, um, uh, should be mocked out. We can test this precondition in the mock. Mm, mm -mm. Um, you have easier test case creation. <clears throat> uh, I said um, easier integration with other things, easier understanding of the code with the specification. Um, uh, you know, communication from developer to tester. Um, and so this would be like dev to test, right? Um, dev uh, to tester. Um, just mm -mm. pay attention to this stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Every year, I give this review. It's a little bit different every year because my emphasis is, is different. So, so I give a custom review for what we covered. And each time, I walk away and I think like uh, they're all going to score hundred percent this year. Like Tartman head's going to go after me because he, he's going to say like, um, like you can't have grades this high. And then the exam date comes along and then I mark, mark them and I cry. It's, it's, <laughs> pay, pay attention to what I'm saying. Okay. Pay attention here. Talk about freebies. I mean, man, my gosh. Um, anyway, um, so you have easier understanding of the code, clear documentation of the derived requirement. You can figure out sort of what's um, what you got to do here in some cases. Um, and sometimes you can optimize things, right? If you know this thing never has a duplicate or you know it's in order, man, you can do some optimizations, right? You can do a binary search and array, if you know it's in order or what have you. Um, um, and, and generally speaking, specifications take time, but they pay it back, they're an investment. Let's talk, ladies and gentlemen, if we may, fakes, mocks, and stops. Um, the idea here, look, create a, create a doppelganger for something, right? Um, uh, these are close cousins of each other. Um, Mocks generally have more intelligence than fakes. Fakes like might return a trivial value and identity, you know, a constant value or a random value every time. Mocks, they might check the preconditions that they're being called with. Um, so, you know, check that certain conditions hold. Um, um, might check this method is only ever called once, or method A is called before method B. They're more intelligent. They can check more conditions, and often they they can be declared declaratively. Um, you know what it should should check things like JMOC support that. You can support an expectation, um, and um, you know you could um, put in place um, mock mocking that, for example, logs things, et cetera. It's not just a totally trivial thing, um, but you know it, it could have some nice behavior associated with it. Um, stubs are kind of fake remarks for particular methods. Um, stub was the older term. When I was a young man um, and the world was still cooling, you still had ones and zeros in them. Um, we, uh, we had, uh, Stubs were, were all we had. And then we had mocks later, um, pigs and mocks. Um, why would you do this? Well, you do it for a couple of reasons, right? Um, uh, two of the big ones is number one, you can write code against this thing before the actual thing is, is created by mocking it out. So if you have module A that calls module B and C, you mock out, you mock out B and C you can test A against the mocks, even though B and C aren't implemented yet, right? But the other thing you do, of course, is you want to test A in isolation of B and C. You don't want to 
tangle up the testing of A all the, all the time with that of B of C. For integration tests, fine. And sometimes they're called unit integration tests where you're just testing A and it calls off to B and C. But the point is it's kind of an integration thing because you're testing B and C in the process. If B is broken, you're going to be, A is going to be broken because it's calling off to it, right? So mocks provide this way of testing A in isolation. How is that working? And testing it separately from B and C, um, uh, which, which can be you know, more um, surgical and more careful in our testing. You can really test is A ever really working. And it can be really convenient to do that if A is calling off to, if B and C are involved in throbbing the database or going over the network or, you know, doing some god awful thing, you know, um, writing things to disk or whatever. By mocking them out, you don't have to have your tests all the time do that, right? Update the screen or whatever. Um, so let's talk about testing, right? Um, um, so we talked many things about testing, but um, uh, there's, we talked about the V model that I was mentioning um, and uh, the goals of, of having testing and continuous integration. Uh, we talked about taxonomy of tests from many angles, the level of test, unit testing, unit integration, integration, system testing across multiple features, for example, or, you know, use cases, um, user stories, and acceptance. Um, but we could also talk about automated versus manual. Um, um, automated tests, you know, often you can run them quicker than someone could do it manually, but they take a lot of time to write. And they break easily in some cases, and in which case you got to keep them up to date. Um, often it can it can take you know a lot more time than than running one time of the test. It might take um, you know ten times the amount of time it takes to manually run the test to to sort of maintain it as an automated test case, particularly if it's a fast changing thing that easily breaks it from the um, front end. Um, manual testing is great for exploratory uh, analysis, right? Where you can follow your nose and, well, that seems kind of, that seems kind of slow. What's going on there? And you, you know, you push it and you push it. Um, you know, this part of the system is kind of soft. And so you can, you can go at it. You never want to get rid of uh, manual testing. But automated testing is really good as part of a CI pipeline, for example, where you can run a bunch of tests overnight, for example. Um, goal of smoke testing, of course, is not to locate a bug. It's to let you know if the whole system is sane, right? If, it, if it's so broken um, that, you know, the latest, um, the latest poll uh, has, has broken it badly, then, that's an issue. And uh, you want to know that as soon as possible so it can be fixed. Um, it's kind of a red flag for an issue involving um, the version, version control. Something's been checked into the code base that's broken it. Um, but other types of tests you know, can be divided um, manual, automated. And then, and then you also have black box versus white box, black back box sort of, or glass box. Um, Black box tests um, what um, this is doing, you know, that it it's meeting its its um, its design. Um, whereas white box tests the implementation correctness, um, and black box often um, you know you're not testing based on the structure of the code, whereas white box you are. Um, we talked about uh, some about test hooks you know, hooks that allow you to get more information, find out if that connection to the database was successful or how many rows were inserted into the database last time, or, you know, um, how many entries are in this um, uh, this lookup table in the system or, or the number of rows read in from the spreadsheet or whatever. Um, these are 
components of the system that are not designed for system code more generally. They're designed for, um, for, for being able to test and debug the system. Um, we, we build them for other developers for the development process, not for the, not for the, the system that's, you know, going to be ultimately uh, built with them. They're a bit like scaffolding on a, on a building that's being built, right? The forms we put them in place while we're building, but those are not part of the ultimate building. Those will not be part of the code that's running, um, um, in the full system. Um, but we will remove them after the the building is fully built, right? Um, like the forms for the concrete or the the scaffolding, etc. Um, um, yeah. So testing is more than finding bugs. Testing is the testers are the first power users. They can find other types of quality problems besides bugs. They can find aesthetic issues, usability issues, you know, slowness, non-functional requirements issues um, that are not technically bugs, but are, are really significant issues that, that need to be addressed, um, significant quality concerns. Um, they could find aesthetic affronts, right? Um, misspellings, all those sort of things can be found in manual testing. Um, Testing metrics, fault feedback ratio. Um, I had introduced fault feedback ratio um, as a construct. And, and basically it says, for each defect you find, how many do you insert? Um, so uh, if it's 0.5, for every two defects you fix, you, you introduce one new defect. For every one defect you fix, you, on average half, you know, coin flip it, but if, if you'll uh, introduce a new defect, right? Um, so if I fix 100 defects, I've introduced 50, 50 new ones. Turns out the fault feedback ratio, if memory serves me, it's something like for many projects where studies have been done, it's like 0.3 if you're modifying fewer than some threshold of, of, of number of lines of code. Um, I think it may be 50 lines of code or something, but... Um, so that means like for every three bugs you fix, you introduce one. Um, but if it's more than 50 bag lines of code, it's like 0.5 or greater, 0.6 or something like that. I'll, I'll see if I can find the statistic on it. Um, that's important because if you go and fix a bug, let's suppose you're late in the game, right? And you, you're, you're gonna go fix that bug shortly before you're gonna ship for shortly before you submit, certainly before this goes live. The risk is if you fix it, you might have not have time to retest it, right? And, and to find a new bug. You might not have located a new bug. And so it's the devil you know versus the devil you don't know, right? And often we live with the devil we don't know. Sorry, we do know because, because we can document it. We can put a work around or, or we can just depth you know, not let the user uh, access a feature that's not ready for prime time. If we introduce bugs uh, and we don't have time to, to thoroughly test them for, for them, et cetera, we, we may get who knows what sort of breakage. Um, test case design, we talked about, um, and I'm not sure it's, uh, yeah, um, uh, equivalence classes. Um, uh, we talked about boundary values. Uh, uh, we talked about creating, again, for each test case, it's a very, very concrete test case. If this code, ladies and gentlemen, this code you were dealing with, you'd be passing a different strings, right? Particular strings that would test this. Um, uh, find first, find the location in it, right? Um, be testing with very particular inputs. If, if it were a bunch of methods, like in a class, you'd be, um, you'd be calling maybe this method first and that method and that method um, and making sure it works for these different sequences um, of, of calls. Um, but the idea is a test case, very specific, unambiguous things you're testing. 
and you're making sure it gives the expected results. With a method, maybe it has the right return value, right? Um, if it's a class and you have a bunch of methods in the class, you'll call one after the other and make sure they return the right results. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, the process of, of triage basically means um, figuring out what, what you're going to fix when you don't have time to fix it all. This is common. And what you're, you know, are we going to fix these tier two or tier three, priority three, priority two bugs? Um, are we willing to leave them? Because um, who knows what, what we'll introduce. Um, maybe, maybe you decide, okay, these two priority one bugs and, and this priority two bug will remove, but this other priority two and priority three and four bugs will leave. Um, that's triage. Directed triage is going through all the defects um, in the system uh, and figuring out, uh, are they duplicates? Uh, you know, sanitizing them, figuring out are they duplicates? Uh, are they outdated? Um, are they so incomplete? We don't know what they mean. And then classifying their priority and basically figuring out where are we at? This is a matter of risk management. Um, uh, sort of you're, you're doing directed triage. You're wading through these, these defects and figuring out uh, like what's our real defect situation here in terms of the defects we have recorded in the system? How bad is it, right? Like, are these real defects or are they so many duplicates that we're really, we're only dealing with this much smaller number, for example. Um, um, you know, we've talked about test team, development team, buddy testing, where, you know, you have tests you're working with the uh, development. I'm actually pretty happy about how this went this semester. We also had the switching, but traditionally, you know, testers and developers have been a bit at tension because testers often find issues with the code of developers and, and there can be, you know, hurt pride and there can be um, uh, feeling hounded and there can be feeling um, uh, that it's uh, unfair, but testers can feel looked down upon by developers, et cetera. Um, they're not getting time of day. They're not, the quality concerns are not being taken seriously, fair enough. Um, uh, so, Oh, this is important, yeah. Um, if there are test escapes, there's a notion of test escape. I'm not sure how much I emphasize this. I don't remember mentioning it actually. It's a notion of a, a test escape, which is a defect that didn't get caught by testers um, and instead is found by the users. Um, and this can be very bad when, when it happens. Um, it can impact their perception of quality. Um, uh, it can impact uh, their ability to pursue their tasks with the system. Um, it can lead to them feeling negative value has been delivered, right? Um, and you should be wondering like, why did, what was wrong with our process that we didn't catch this? How, how did it get in there in the first place? But how did it get missed by our testing, right? How did it get, it, did it get missed by our automated testing or manual testing? How did it get missed by our, our CI pipeline? If you can ask that question and you, you can turn, you can turn, you know, um, lead into gold. You can turn a problem that has been embarrassing things been found by the user into an opportunity to do better and to have a, have a more rigorous process. You can figure out how to up your game with the testing. That you know will drive you forward. You fail forward, right? Um, you learn from your mistakes. Fail early, fail often by learning. Um, and. Um, you know, we talked about the role automated testing plays. Automated testing comes in many forms. UI, this is another taxonomy, UI-based automated testing, 
Um, you know, unit testing is commonly automated, almost invariably. Um, system testing is often automated. And so it should be um, in many cases. Here you're calling API components that would be called by the user interface, but you're calling them programmatically to put it through its paces, right? Through a user story or what have you, a use case, a broader thing for system tests. Uh, and, you know, code coverage, the code coverage tools, um, um are um are often useful to know which statement says it realized they won't necessarily give you prime paths and they won't give you transitions generally but they will give you statements um and people do in industry i remember in the 1980s um colleague of mine uh at microsoft doing transition coverage testing in excel um when i was a member of that team uh so um find first here um uh you know we we talked about uh test cases for this this is the sort of thing you might be asked about um so testing defect reporting um uh processes what what sort of thing would be on a on a, on a defect report um um and and classifications of bugs you know what's priority what's severity um priority is are we going to fix it? Uh, it often it includes some consideration of how serious is it, but how likely is it to occur? Um, severity is how bad is it if it occurs? And there's really bad ones. Um, crashing bug, a hanging bug, it just freezes the system. A bug that causes data loss, negative value, right? Rather of it hang and or die than have it destroy data, destroy my data. Um, hanging and freezing won't, you know, cause me to lose things where, uh, you know, in, in, in quite the same way that destroying an entire document or something would. Um, um, yeah, we talked some about, you know, testing can be risk driven, um, testing things that are more suspect soft areas of the system. Uh, often that can be done in an exploratory way. Um, separation of concerns on testing. Separation of concerns allows different areas of the system to be separated out and often allows well-defined interfaces that can be tested. If it's all a big hairball, it's really hard to test. If it's separated out, parceled out into neat pieces, often if they're smaller pieces, with clear responsibilities, clear properties associated with them, we can test them. If we break it up into functions, in order for the function to do its job, it has to take arguments, for example, we know what it depends on and we can test it more easily. If it's just part of a giant hairball, how to get in there to test different portions, what bit of code depends on is not clear by looking at it. But if it's divided up, it is much clearer. We can specify using specifications, those different pieces. We can mock them out, for example. Um, we can test them independently. Um, yeah. Um, oh, fall versus failures. You may recall there was a time I stood upon a chair and, and uh, evoked uh, in a in a um, stentorian voice, the fact that testing finds failures, peer reviews find faults. Mm, finds faults. Let that sink in a moment. Again, testing finds failures. It finds evidence, you know, a symptom. Something's gone wrong. This thing didn't return the right value this thing crashed, um, this thing hung, this thing, you know, gave a weird, did it did something weird when, when I did it. it, it did the wrong thing or whatever. Um, uh, it did something obnoxious. Um, that's what testing finds. And then to figure out why you have to go in and burrow around the code, right? Um, you go, you undergo debugging. 
Meanwhile, peer reviews find faults. They find underlying problems in the code. Of course, it takes work, but you find, you know, that doesn't make sense. I won't handle this case, right? Uh, oh, you're not handling this, uh, this case where the disk is full or something, or where you're out of memory, uh, or where the network's down. And you reason these things through and you find faults directly and you cut out the, the uh, um, you know, the debugging side of things. It's why, mark my words, it's why testing, uh, while it's awesome, while it's irreplaceable, while it's absolutely essential, if we compare it to peer review, Peer review can find a larger fraction of bugs. Empirically, studies have borne it out. And it can find them more efficiently in terms of human time, kind, human kind, human time compared to, to testing. Mm. Um, but of course, it's not an either or. We can do peer reviews of tests and find better ways to test. When in peer reviews, there can be things that are hard to reason about or crufty code we identify in peer reviews that we really want to test well. The two work hand in hand. They're two, two wings of a bird working together. Um, but truth is, on a per hour basis, peer review can actually get us further. Um, but it's not either or. You always want both together. Um, and you know, peer review can identify good tests, right? Um, you do peer reviews of tests. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, generally, uh, testers do integration testing, system testing, acceptance testing. Developers do unit testing. And sometimes, you know, some developers will do unit integration testing. And some, and some testers will do unit integration testing. Um, there's often some overlap there. Um, test dogs, test harnesses, yeah, sure. Um, things that we call out to the test, um, to, to, to perform the test. Uh, uh, sure, driving declaratively, I, don't worry about that much. Um, um, test dynamics, yeah, there can be a long delays between bug appearing in the code base and when it's discovered and when it's elimination and when it's eliminated. Um, and uh, that cycle is key and, and, you know, speeding it up. Peer reviews help speed it up. Testing helps peer, uh, speed it up. We talk about estimating undiagnosed defects in three different basic ways, two of which are accessible to a smaller project uh, with, without a lot of history. Uh, the three basic ways were, number one, uh, we, we talked about uh, historical uh, data uh, from past projects. You know, for a large company, um, uh, that, that's possible. You know, uh, Google, um, Meta, um, uh, if, if we had uh, Amazon, Oracle, et cetera, might be possible. Um, many teams working on sort of... Uh, similar languages and, and libraries, maybe a whole bunch of React development projects, you might be able to compare. But the two ways that are very accessible are number one, defect seeding, and there's tools for doing this, inserting defects and then trying to find them. And the other one, which you experience, I think all the teams is bug parties. And um, easily done, you should know the formula and you should know how it's applied. Um, Oh, 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 this what am I saying? Principal. Barbara Liskov was not a principal. Um, principal. Um, this year, I didn't really talk about alpha and beta testing. Look, alpha and beta testing are often marketing gimmicks. I mean, they're they're not real strategies for for doing testing. Often, you don't get great feedback from your power users. There, there, there are ways to power users to see it, but you don't often get great feedback. People aren't that motivated often to to report things and so on. I mean, they're, they're, they're good, but they give people a taste of it, but really a lot of it is a marketing, marketing thing. I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying, don't look on it as a testing strategy. Don't hang your testing hat on it, that it's gonna save you. 
Um, regression tests. Ah, okay. Um, why is why are regression tests so? Why do we why do we give them their own name and and, and consider them so important? Well, look, um, features that already work. If it if they break, they confer it disastrous consequences. We right we deliver negative value to our users. We deprive them of features they've been counting on. They've worked and they you know um, placed into their workflow, and and then suddenly they're they're broken. Um, cause a lot of concern. They want an upgrade, instead they got a downgrade, right? Um, uh, that's bad. But also regression, the term regression, not only includes description of features that stop working, but also defects that existed before that reappear, zombie-like, come back from the dead. And that happens quite a bit because of um, slime sloppy reasoning, because of merge conflicts, which lead to old code to be introduced into the code base. Um, and uh, it can be other reasons too, but, but defects come back and, and regressions occur there. So regression tests you know, will often make sure that the code is still working, the features are still working, and that these defects that we fixed a long time ago and which the test found initially they were fixed and the test verified they were fixed. We put it in our regression suite and, um, and we'll run it. And for big companies or big projects or company projects have been running a long time, these regression tests might have tens of thousands of tests you know, associated with them. Um, all these tests of things that were fixed from the past might not test them every time in our continuous integration build, but we uh, will do them in our regression test running once a night or whatever. Oh, okay, test escape, I, I spoke about triage directed. Um, in other words, yes, I spoke about that. Test focus, yes, yes. Equivalence classes, yeah. So you have these sort of classes of things that you expect to be kind of similar in terms of how they're handled, right? For square root, you have positive integer squares and you have, you might, you might try it with, things that are not positive integers, you have zero and you have one, and, and then you have negative values if it, if, if it um, uh, is, is within its preconditions. You have boundary values, things uh, you know, between areas, like so you might have um, you know, adults and children handled differently in a booking system, and you test something where they're exactly 18 or something like that, and, and you see how that's handled. Is it handled? correctly, because often we as programmers fall prey to off by one issues. Uh, uh, Latin squares, hypercubes, I mean, um, here we're, we're getting um, each possible value for, for uh, each variable. Uh, and we're getting, we're getting each possible value at least once um, for a given variable. Um, Orthogonal rays give you all pairs of possible values, uh, which is beyond Latin, uh, Latin squares and hypercubes, which, which guarantee you each value has been explored in at least one test case, but not all combinations. Orthogonal rays are not all combinations, they're just pairs. Um, uh, every unique pair guaranteed to exist, but not all possible combinations. Vastly lower count of, of, of unique pairs compared to all possible combinations. We talked about path coverage, node transition, and we we talked about um, prime path coverage. Um, hmm. um, quality bug reports. Um, <coughs> yeah. Um, um, and and well, we didn't really talk this year about infeasibility of, of test coverage. But, um, you know, perfect test coverage where you cover every possible path in general is not possible because you can't solve the halting problem. Some of you will know what I mean by that. Others won't, but basically in general, it's, it's not feasible. Um, so coverage procedures, whether you're testing node-based coverage, prime path, transition coverage, or we didn't talk about it, but for that matter, logic coverage, there's three basic steps. 
We identify the set of things we need to cover. That's one. We identify the prime paths. We identify the, the nodes. We identify the transitions, whatever. We say, we want to cover this. Then we get a, a set of paths from start to finish that include all the things we need to cover. And then we develop. So this must be legal paths from start to finish. Can cover these things. Don't get confused. It's like for, for prime paths, those paths from start to finish will include, they might include, given paths from start to finish might include five different prime paths. That's fine. Um, but we want to cover all prime paths between these different paths from start to finish. And then we have to figure out concrete test cases that will exercise each of those paths from start to finish that we plotted out to cover all the things you want to cover, be it the nodes, be it the the transition be of the, the prime pass. This can be done at the code level. It can be done at, at the system level, right? The pass through the system, like that ATM machine that I showed you at one point. At different ways you can kind of wind through it. Um, regardless whether it's at the high level or low level, the basic idea is the same. You figure out what you want to cover. You develop a set of paths that include from start to finish, then include all those things. And, and, and then you develop a set of concrete test cases um, that lead to these being covered, the sort of path based thing. Um, yeah, I, I talked about peer reviews. Um, they're not really trade off, they're, they're complementary, um, but peer reviews are, are awesome. Um, uh, look, um, we, we talked about different spectrum of reviews, right? From, pair programming and informal pair desk check all the way to formal inspections. And they differ in a bunch of different ways. Um, I'm not expecting you to know each one, what a walkthrough, a structured walkthrough is, what exactly inspection, but you should basically know how they differ. I mean, look, some involve preparation, some involve confirmation, like traditional inspections involve confirmation after the fact that things have been fixed. Some involve people taking on multiple, you know, defined roles, right? Inspections do, walkthroughs do. Um, uh, for inspections, traditionally, the person whose items, artifacts are being inspected uh, is not the presenter. There's a separate presenter of them. Um, uh, some involve a pre-phase where, you know, there's a pre-meeting that sets the expectations and sometimes circulates what's to be reviewed, um, sets the goals. Um, some, by contrast, are done spontaneously, live, like, like pair programming. And you could even talk about, you know, um, peer reviews of pull requests as, as a legitimate type of peer review too. Um, um, so, you know, something you should know something about the formal review structure that it requires different roles. You know, have some sense of what roles might those include, um, and good and bad uses of, of reviews. Um, yeah, I, I I wouldn't worry about um, the rest much. Okay, and we dealt with Liskov substitution principle, ladies and gentlemen. Liskov substitution principle. Um, so. And this is all about sub safe subtyping, right? It's all about safe subtyping in the context of polymorphism. We can pass around a banana or an orange or an apple as if it is a fruit. Mm. Um, and uh, this subtype, the bananas, the apples, the oranges of the world, must in some sense be compatible with what someone expects from a super type, from a fruit as a whole. Um, it involves behavioral compatibility. It has to behave like a dignified fruit. Um, and this is not something that a compiler is going to be able to check in today's technologies. Um, we should not, if we're expecting, you know, a fruit. We should not be surprised to be a fruit of an of an, egg, right? of a, of an apple or of a banana. That shouldn't rudely surprise us. So just like uh, 
fine timer shouldn't really surprise someone who all they know is it's a coarse timer. Um, um, we talked about how polymorphism enables decoupling of apparent type and actual type. I, I have my code. All I know is it's a fruit. I know it as a fruit, it has um, a central, general set of functionality. Um, I don't know what the actual type is. I don't know that it's a banana or a mango or a jackfruit or a durian or a mangosteen or rambutan or a, um, a banana. Um, or an apple. All I know is that it's an apparent type. Um, I may have coded it against the apparent type long before the, many of these actual types were ever created. And, and my code has no knowledge of, of what they are, but it can call, you know, it programs against the apparent type interface. It calls a method foo in the apparent type and it's dispatched against the actual type. It actually is called, you know, if it's a banana, if I call peel on the fruit, you know, and it's a banana, peel the banana, a banana gets peeled. I call peel on, on this fruit and, and it turns out to be an apple. It gets on the apple peel, right? Um, peel on the apple. The dispatch is against the actual type is what we say. Um, we're, we're programming against the apparent type of this. All we know is that it's a fruit um, and it could be any type of fancy fruit in the future that I never that didn't exist when I wrote this code to, to deal with that, but it will support it. That's why we have this support for evolving systems with object-oriented programming. We can put in new actual types and they'll work with this older code that works with the parent type. Um, okay. Um, now, there's, you know, there's two, there's a number of problems that come out. Um, uh, and one is that the Liskov substitution principle, the claim subtypes, the apple, the, the banana, are not behavioral subtypes. They're not proper subtypes. They look like one to the compiler. They say, I'm an apple. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a fruit, but they ain't. They're not a dignified fruit. They behave in a way unbecoming of a fruit. Um, they cause a violation of the of the expectations of someone who sees a fruit and says a fruit, you know, can um, can only do this, and and we we violated that in this subfruit. Um, um, and then there's a separate issue we talked about in that other room involving subclassing, which is this whole add all add example, for example, that I that I gave to make that concrete. And um, so the Liskov substitution principle had to do with the first of these. It's about the promises made. It's about the contracts. And it, the principle reflects the need to reason about safely in the presence of polymorphism. Right? Any property that is provable about the supertype um, should be provable about the subtype. Um, if the supertype is immutable, the subtype should be immutable. If uh, the, the supertype, um, uh, has some attribute that only rises over time, the subtype has to adhere to that. If that's something promised for the supertype. Um, yeah, there is something as part of the contract for the supertype. It's a matter of FedEx adhering to the FedEx contract. Um, it's, it's common sense. You don't want to break the code of someone who, uh, who whose code was written before you even, you know, you even had your subtype around. Um, and they could be counting on the contract of the super type and you are claiming to adhere to that contract and you don't, it's bad news. Um, you're breaking their code. Um, you could of course not claim to adhere to that contract. That's fine. That's great. But if you're going to adhere to the contract, um, you got to adhere to the contract. Um, now. As programmers, if you're the one who wrote the contract to the supertype, you can choose what to promise and what not to promise. That's also fine. But if you promise it, you got to stand by it for the subtypes. Um, uh, they have to be compatible with, they have to jibe with, they have to be consistent with the promises of the supertype. And, and this is requirements for signature compatibility, which are, the compiler can 
can check that, but it's really um, these two things, you know, that methods have to behave consistent with those of a subtype. You can't say, this is an increments method for the subtype, and I'm going to make it, I'm going to call it funky counter, and increment will double it every time. No, 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 that's, that's not kosher. That's not, that's not acceptable. Um, secondly, um, the subtype interface has to preserve these provable properties um, of the of the supertype. So it, it's got to, you know, if the supertype makes a promise that it can only decline implicitly or explicitly makes that promise, doesn't disavow it or anything. Um, it, it seems to must be the case based on what it provides, then you've got to, you've got to adhere to it, adhere to it right? Um, and you know, I expect you to be able to reason reason this through. Um, and you know, once again, who relies on these specifications? The users and the creators benefit from them. Um, um, so, the the creators know what's promised and what they have to adhere to, um, and the users know what's promised and and can count on it. Um, and they see what's not promised, and they know. You know they they can't count on that, um, right? Um, so we talked about subclass specification. Here we're dealing with this issue of implementation. This was all about let's go substitution principle. It was all about promises. This is about implementation. It's about does your at all in the super in the super class, not just type class, does it call add? I need to know that because if I, as a member of creating a subclass, if I override add, add, does it now automatically handle add all or not? I need to know something more about the implementation of the class, the super class. That didn't come in for the of substitution principle. No, 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 no. I don't have to know what calls what. All I know is about the promises. That's fine. Here I have to know what calls what because I'm changing the implementation. Let me put in place a new variable, right? And new new attribute. And I I want the get and the set to use that attribute. And I need to know if the is positive going to use it, et cetera. Um, these are extra requirements associated with this. Um, so there's an idea of a uh, subclass interface that we can use uh, here that um, that basically we say, hey, look, for anyone who wants to subclass me, those people want to use instances of me. They don't care if at all calls add. I mean, people who just want to use an instance of, don't have to know that. But someone wants to subclass me, I gotta say whether at all calls that calls add because they if they're gonna be able to override add and you know add, you got to know. It's going to support add all to. Okay. Um, so remember this this whole thing with add all, et cetera. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so it's the difference in the contract concerns, which are list of substitution principle, and the implementation concerns, which are concerning, you know, the implementation of the methods at all in that. Those are all my slides, ladies and gentlemen. Those are all my slides. Those are all the detailed comments I get. Let's just go see what's in the chat, shall we? Um, yeah, I'll post it to campus. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll post them up there. That's good. I'll help you. Sure, you can, you can take a look at them. Mm -hmm. So what questions could I answer though? Yeah. Let me let me do that while I while I talk. Um I'm under I'm like I've got it like a zillion things uh hounding at me right now. So so let me let me just get her done and, and we'll um we'll get it up there and, and you can go look at that. So here we go. Um but what questions could I meanwhile answer here? Um, for the post mortem, do you want it handed in at the final, like a paper copy, or 
can we hand it in on canvas or something yeah i'll 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 post a canvas um hand in area where you can um you know, where you can place it there that is preferred but i will accept paper copies um as well at the at the time of the the, the final exam that's also fine yeah so either one is fine that's for both individual and and group but I, I will have separate hand in areas and it's somewhat preferred uh, if you do that. It's just one less thing for me to sort of tote around and 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 so on. Um, and yeah. and sorry, the individual ones, they're optional, right? Or uh, are they mandatory? The individual ones are optional. Um, they are not required. Um, they are, uh, you know, they're, they're good things to give. Um, uh but it's it's not strictly required you know so okay um, um you do you know i would encourage you if you don't turn in an individual post-mortem um that you consider uh maybe putting it into the um uh you know putting putting something in at the final exam itself that at least reminds me of what you what you did right for the project um and you could put some comments there in in very abbreviated almost bullet point type fashion that's also welcome and, and that would be a pithy way of providing it and you can do that on the exam itself yeah all right thank you yeah mm -hmm. um of the previous pop-up quizzes, um, pop quizzes, um, I went over the answers with you. Um, so my inclination would be to, to say no. Um, I've never given them out in past years and I will sometimes reuse them. And so um, I went over the answers with you in class. So uh, I'm, my inclination would be to say uh, no. Um, uh, not uh, not something I'm I'm willing to give out there. Good question, but just um, not something I do. Uh, professor, I'm asking you. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you this question just because after every student, the um, after we write the exam, we just won't have an opportunity to talk with you maybe, or like mm. um, express our like thoughts. And I do realize, and I have the confidence that you do appreciate our feedback from the exam, Indeed. the final. Indeed. Um, so like, I just, my question is basically, do you think that two or to two and, and a half hour of time to <laughs> be able to finish the final is a lot? No, I'm asking you this because I don't know if the concepts were are not too difficult or because um, you taught them to us super well. But to me personally, I don't see the the concepts that you teach us in class. They're very important, very interesting, uh, very beneficial, but I don't see them extremely complicated. So like with that being said, should we be worried for that? we're going to be surprised tomorrow that the final is still going to be challenging just in terms of length or complications hope that you got the message or i i asked yeah, it properly. yeah yeah no no i think i think it's a sensible question um and you're right i i don't think there's anything very subtle or um conceptually tricky you know here um uh Although I, I will say like the, some students have problems with the Liskov substitution principle. Um, some students have problems with classes, um, class subclass. Um, some problems have, some, some students have real problems, real problems, real problems, real problems with testing. Like, 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 real problems with testing <laughs> like they can't do it worth beans um and i don't know what's wrong like um uh, i i i don't know what's going on um 
uh, so uh, if if I explained it well, then um, that's reassuring to hear because um, I, I've seen some students have real problems with testing. Now, this semester, I especially hit that home many, many times. Um, <laughs> um, so, so, like, I don't think it's very hard. I think I've emphasized the, I, I, I sorry, sorry, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, testing, good testing is hard, actually. But the questions I ask in the exam involving testing um, are not um, really complicated testing problems. They are, they're, they're, um, they're ones where thoughtful answers are required. Um, and uh, I would expect them to be accessible, but when a student just doesn't answer it at all, or doesn't like, like they give a, an answer that is, um, um, mysterious. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just like, uh, you ask them, you know, um, uh, take the square root of, of, uh, you know, take the square root of four, and they say like, um, uh, minus uh, minus pi times e to the hundredth. Or something. <laughs> whoa, where did that come from? Um, so students sometimes like if there are, they do have problems. Um, and I, I'm not sure where they come from. Um, but I would think if you've listened carefully to this. And if you're comfortable with the sort of things we went over in class, and I went over again and again with exercises, um, et cetera, um, I think you should do very well in the exam. Um, and um, uh, yes, test case, test case uh, design um, was particularly, uh, <laughs> particularly, uh, Particularly brutal. Um, it's like a bloodbath. Some sometimes um, it was really, really. Um, it was brutal. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so like I would think if if I ask you to do the sort of things I asked you to do in class, I'm not talking about whether the whale is facing the wrong way and the you know, the drummer has the wrong arm up. Like other than those things, like all those things you did for take home or, or in-class exercises, I would expect to be pretty accessible. And I, I, I think I've explained these things so that if you're asked to do them again, you, you will know basically what is, what the steps are, what you have to be called upon to do. Um, um, but um, each year I'm surprised and, and I'm a bit shocked because, you know, some people don't know where to, to start for certain types of questions, but I don't think it's a matter of time enough. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, um, th they maybe haven't been, you know, paying attention to um to these components of the course but this year i flipped the course for the like this year i did a lot more in class exercises to like drive home you know understanding so hopefully that will help so hopefully i will see you walk out tomorrow with a, a light footstep um you know um and you'll feel um that you know there were no surprises yeah <laughs> I see I'm not alone in my hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So yeah, I mean, I I don't think it should check. Um, multi-tier architecture. Um, good question. Um, now with multi-tier architectures, um, you should know what broad layers there are. Um, um, there's a data layer and it's different from, it's 
it's at a different different level and then and you know only loosely coupled with the um or only called down to from the data logic layer or the excuse, business logic layer with kind of representation of the model um of this system and then there's the ui layer i mean you should know about those areas and that um the upper layers can call down to the lower ones um um there's some interfaces um uh, uh that will allow it to, to call but um sometimes there's callback interfaces going upwards but um you should know about that and you should recognize that it helps testing it helps scalability it helps um conceptual clarity it helps mocking out um whole layers uh it helps um have different technologies for each different languages uh it helps different people work on those different components it helps mix and match things so again my smartphone and my web interface and my desktop app can all make use of the business logic because it's a it's it's a separate it's carved out from separately the ui right the, the web app uses the, maybe the web ui which uses the business logic, but these other components can connect to it. And, um, and then, uh, you know, that's, that's favorable because it allows, you know, getting many benefits um, uh, across different areas of a multi-tier system and multi kind of access um, system um, supported from one code base. Um, by this business logic, this kind of model of the system that captures the essential logic. Those are um, those are important things I'd like you to to know. Um, um, how many questions are there? Um, right now, there's too many. Uh, right now, uh, I have something like, uh, and I'd have to double check the number, but I think it's like fifty. Uh, 50 questions or something like that. And um, I'm not counting some on the sort of the things like any personal postmortem comments or your contributions to it. Uh, something, something of that order. And, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be cutting, cutting some out. Um, so, so that's, that's too many, but um, more, more than um, I like to have fewer than I've had in some past years, to be honest. Other questions? Um, yeah. Other questions? So um, I guess uh, I should also mention, I mean, no one's coming forward and I, I'm not going to say something that will shift to an entirely different topic, um, leaving this one behind. Keep on thinking if you have any questions. I did post those slides, so you know if you want to go root around them and kind of you know come up with any questions, you're welcome to in the next minute or two as I describe this. But um, this semester is not yet. Uh, like the what you've built this semester um for every project i'm proud of I'm proud of that project and um uh i'm my, my relationship to these projects um is varied uh, but for all of them um you have played key roles uh as teams and I played a role in, in helping at a technical level and sometimes as a stakeholder. And uh, so regardless of whether you're in team one, two, or three, um, I, I do expect that there'll be some um, opportunities for further contact involving these projects for people who would like to, um, to be further involved with them or their consolidated versions. Um, uh, 
for those two projects for which I'm the stakeholder, active stakeholder, uh, I will, I, I have active hopes and um, my plan would be to meet with the the teams on an optional basis. I'm not saying the whole teams. I'm saying anyone who wants to wants to come, you know, um, after the final exam. Um, anyone who wants to come um, could 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 come and we can dialogue um, about where this is going. Um, next steps. Um, um, I want your your uh, importance to your as important as I. Um, I want to talk with you about opportunities, interests. Um, where what I see is kind of next steps, but I, I want to hear back from your interests. Um, and uh, some of you have come up to me and asked about continued involvement in some of those projects uh, after this term. And, um, you know, I welcome, uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted to, you know, talk about that. And I think there will be opportunities for that. Um, uh, so, um, there you're it's it's not an obligatory thing but you know i'd welcome interactions and i anticipate that if if you're interested beyond that team one um uh dr filipenko um uh she looks to me on on the technical side to help understand this and uh i can't speak for her what she has in mind but i understand as of yesterday um that uh that she was mentioning excitedly this app to some of her respirology colleagues who were um impressed and talked about the potential of it uh and i'm expecting to engage with her um now that the semester is winding down um and I'm anticipating that there'd probably be a joint meeting where, you know, she and this any members of the student team who are interested in further contact with that project, um, um, in shaping it, and uh, probably myself or I'll I'll get together and and speak. And so, um, you know, the, these projects. This is not required, of course. Um, but if if you are interested in continuing to be involved at one level or another in your projects, I, you know, I'll be delighted to interact with you. In fact, I think you'll have the misfortune of seeing me again. Um, so uh, just bear that in mind. Like, um, you know, this this is not um, just the the close of the class. And and of course, I'm always glad to speak with students. Um, from my classes who would like to to meet up afterwards and uh, normally in this class there, there are some students who want to get together for one thing or another um and i'm, I'm happy to do that um anyone have questions though before we break this session okay i know i'm behind and i still have to get you the um uh the just been one thing after the other. I apologize. Uh, the those those marks for those two um, two deliverables. I, I provided you know feedback uh, verbally, but we need to get you those uh, final marks. And at the latest, I'll probably do that tomorrow during during the exam or something. But you'll you'll get them by the end of tomorrow, for sure. Okay. Any final questions? Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, thanks for the kind words. Uh, you folks have put in a lot of time um, for for this class, and I feel I owe it to you to to you know um, help help you uh, help you navigate this and understand what to uh, what to anticipate tomorrow. So um, my goal. After this, if there's no more questions, thanks for the kind comments um, and salutes, salute to all of you for the work well done. Um, really, really pleased. Um, well, uh, thanks. Uh, if it was great, it was because of your your, your teams as well. I, I'm really pleased with how things have gone. Um, so I will 
stop this recording and I will post it up to um, uh, to the uh, course site as soon as it's available. Um, it will be um, something you know for you to to go through if you like it. I, I would also note that I do have similar reviews from past years, but this one is very specific to to what I covered this year, and uh, it's probably probably good for you to to look at that. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, good luck. Uh, all the best if you have a, another exam tomorrow morning, but um, uh, look forward to uh, genuinely to see you tomorrow afternoon and um, to, uh, to answer any questions you may have about the exam uh, during the exam. And of course, um, at the uh, post exam engagement with the, um, with the uh, project related matters. Uh, look forward to that too. Take care there. Best of luck, and uh, I anticipate that you'll be able to handle this well. Okay, take care, and have a good night, and uh, look forward to seeing you.